one of the other things, part of the mind is people, and I want you to remember this, people do exactly what they're comfortable doing. If a guy, and I'm going to bring Roger back in. Roger, come back in. If a guy stands this far away from you, pretty much, he likes to punch. His, his deal is, if I come up to him and I, I want to jump him, and I'm standing out here, I, I'm probably wanting to punch him. I'm comfortable punching. You're not going to find a lot of guys sitting back here trying to kick you, not in a street fight. They're not saying it doesn't happen, but... You know, the bulk of the people are going to stand out here and want to punch. The other half of the guys, or maybe not even half, they're not comfortable punching. They want to shoot in here and come underneath your legs. They, want to, they don't want, like getting hit. They're not comfortable punching. So they want to try to wrestle you to the ground and rush you. It's old bull rush. He comes in here, he grabs me, and he forces me to the ground. You know, just drives me right into the ground. Hey, quick announcement about a flash sale. I'm giving away this stunning foot long fixed blade full tang knife along with an awesome sheath to the first 200 guys who get to the link in the description. It's called the Titan. I just call it the big ass knife. The closest thing I can compare it to is a classic K bar and if you want this $70 knife for just shipping you'll have to act fast. Okay back to our video. Right. So one of the things that we want to do and step back over here Roger is, is we want to take people where they're not comfortable, all right? If that guy is trying to get a little close to me, you know, he's probably going to just drop down and bull rush me. If you remember early, we discussed don't let, the, don't let your opponent's hips get lower than yours. So, you know, we don't want that to happen, right? So if I see him starting to, to come down, first thing I want to do is I want to start moving my legs away from him because he wants to shoot underneath of me. Uh, one of the first things I might do the very first thing that I would do if uh, I'm just getting into this, the guy starts to charge me, so I'm just going to check off, and a check off is just, just slapping. But I want to make, see what I just did, I dropped. I matched hips with him. So I want to set a little drill up. I'll be standing here, he's standing here. He's going to, I just want to drop, right? Every time he drops, I keep my hips down. That's going to make me harder to, to bull over. Even an experienced wrestler, they're going to sprawl on you. So we're going to do our little drill. He's going to do that. I'm just going to drop. Now, we know how to do punching drills, right? Now we're going to, we got that guy that wants to rush me. All right, next thing I want to do, I'm comfortable getting my feet. What he's trying to do is reach over and grab my legs so he can pull them out and run me into the ground or just tackle me like a football player. Let's take my legs out get on top of me and beat me up. You hear the terminology, ground and pound? That's what he wants to do. It's not what I want him to do. So we got the drill where he's going to drop. I'm going to drop. We're going to do that. He's going to drop. I'm going to drop. Next thing I want to do is I want to check off. Check off is no more than just pushing. Just keeping, and, and if he's bigger and stronger than me, he's pushing in, it may push me backwards. It's kind of a sprawling thing. And that's okay too. I just don't want him to get my legs out from underneath me. So now we, I know when he, come, when he gets ready to shoot on me underneath me, I'm going to drop my hips and I'm going to check off, right? So he gets ready to come in, check off, right? Look, that backed him up. All right, he's coming in, check off right and get ready if he comes through that you know we may want to do something else but you got to keep moving with him I check off and he's still penetrating trying to get to my legs I'm just gonna I may start hammering him and put a little choke on him lift him up throw a knee all right so that's what we're gonna do he's gonna check off all right I'm gonna check off as he comes in I'm gonna hit him and then what I want to do is start hammer fist in the back of his neck as he and pushing him to the ground and then start stomping and kicking. That's one of the first options. One of that option is I don't want to go to the ground at all. If I can help it, that's not where I want to be. A lot of guys, if you watch the evolution of uh, some of these mixed martial arts shows on TV, 10 and 15 years ago, the ground fighter was taking a boxing or karate guy down. Today, it's not working that way. They may get them down, but it's a lot harder because people learn, you know? I don't want to be there. It's not that they can't fight on the ground. They're comfortable getting, getting the guy out of there. So when he starts to shoot in, check off and start hammering, hammering, hammering. If you got a guy down there and legs exposed, bang, take those legs out. Kick them out, right? So, but uh, I'll turn that around do the same thing. He comes in. I check off. Hammer, hammer, hammer. He's going down. I got some exposed leg. Bang, just start driving knees into him. <clears throat> I have a lot of nerves that run around the backs of these legs and sides of your legs that really hurt and they create a lot of damage. So 
That's the first thing. Just check off when a guy tries to bull rush you, right? And get your legs away from him. Then you may want to make the drill a little more real where even after I check off, he's still trying to pull my legs out so I can work elbows, hammer fists, knees to the face, whatever. And I want you to practice all of that. It's not difficult. Pick it up and throw it right in his face. All right? Then the next thing I want to do, if I get lucky and he starts to come in and I actually practice and he's still pushing forward, is I may want to do this. I'm going to turn him around just a little bit and get my, the blade of my forearm up under his neck, keeping my legs away from him. I may still start working hammers, holding and hitting, or start pushing him down and then snap back on the neck and try to put him unconscious or maybe pop a couple of vertebrae back there or something. I want to make it work. So once you get a grip under there, one of the things I do, because some of these guys, most of the guys that try to tackle you are, are stronger, wrestlers, football players. I'll come under here and I'll, sometimes I'll grab my own clothes so he can't get my arm loose. He's trying to just hold it on, start hitting, hitting, hitting the back of the head and then jerking on him, right? And then throwing knees. And if they break out, you're still on your feet. Don't let him grab your legs. Hey, my free flash giveaway is still going on. There are still some of these Titans left. This is a foot long full tank fixed blade knife for 70 bucks, but I'm giving it away to the first 200 guys who get to the link in the description. Just pay shipping and I'll rush one out to you right away. Back to our video. Hello, I'm Lieutenant Tony Walker. I've worked as a youth correction officer for over 22 years. And working in an environment that is full of violence and violent people, I truly believe that anyone can survive a violent attack if they use the appropriate techniques and if it's fitted for them, the individual. Regardless of size of the attacker, regardless of size of the person that's being attacked, you can survive with a simple and versatile system I believe that we have created in the system that I work in. One, we use appropriate observation of what is around us, an equal appropriate interpretation of what has happened, what will happen, and also application. Having an effective technique that you can apply to get out of any situation. To do that, I believe that system needs to have key elements. One, balance. Your balance against their balance. Position. Your position towards them and control. Control of yourself and control of the individual. We want the system to be simple yet versatile. We want you to be able to use a technique, learn a technique. We want you to have the confidence to go from one technique to the other. The reason why we teach the way we do, you have to learn the technique. We're not teaching you when to use it. We want you to be versatile enough to flow from one to the next. This creates the calmness. It also, with the calmness, comes the confidence. With that confidence, you will maintain a calmness in any violent situation. You need to be aware of your surroundings and environment at all times. Let's take these techniques a little slower. As I approach, I see that this individual is coming at me. I'm also aware of my surroundings and that I can't retreat, run into the person that's behind me or the table. So I have to let this attack come. As he approaches and swings, I adhere to his fist. By doing so, when he throws it, a snapping motion onto his hand will force his thumb to separate. I will then use a thumb lock, which is placing one finger on the joint, pushing the thumb off, and snapping it down. Taking him to the ground in that motion going down. As when I'm doing this, I notice that this individual is also approaching, so I turn my hips to face him. Now, I could attempt to totally disable him with the thumb lock, knowing that this individual is also have, having the ability to swing as well as grab, or even just push me off balance into, I need to get rid of him quickly. So 
As he approaches, I want to take a finger lock, which is pushing these fingers into the palm of my hand. As he comes, I push him in and use the leverage from my hand once he goes and breaks his balance and locking him down. I can take both of them and continue to put uh, pain compliance on them to end their attack. Sometimes you need to defend yourself and others as well. I'm going to show this one more time. As the attacker got up, grabbed his weapon, and approached the victim, I went into a chin lock. Taking him off balance, I could have done a number of different things. One, I could have went into a bar arm. I could have kept him up, walked him off. But because of his size and the weapon in his hand, I chose to take him to the ground. And taking him to the ground, I lock him out. The bottle's of no use to him now. Anytime you are faced with a violent situation, you want to be able to defuse that situation quickly, become a part to it. What I mean by becoming a part to it, remain calm. Hi, my name is Tom Carter, former Delta operator. Hello, my name is Frank Cucci, former SEAL Team 6 operator. I'd like to start this program off by relaying a story to you. It's one that's about a survivor and a non-survivor. In the mid-80s, a young female who was married to a, a Delta operator and her child was walking out to the parking lot of a Fayetteville, North Carolina shopping mall. She had parked on the outside perimeter of the parking lot and she moved to her car from a day of shopping with her child. She opened the door and typically put the child in the car seat, at which time an assailant moved in on her with a knife. He jumped in the car with her and she began immediately fighting for her life and for her child's life. She was stabbed more than once in her legs, but still managed to get her child out of the car seat and out the opposite door to safety. The assailant did steal her car and immediately drove a short distance to Chapel Hill, North Carolina where he picked up two co-eds. One co-ed, during the initial contact, jumped out of the car and ran. The other co-ed was intimidated by the knife that was being held at her and stayed in the car. To make a long story short, this individual was captured and turned state's evidence to locate the body of the co-ed that he had murdered, brutally chopped up, put in a 55-gallon drum, and put in a rock quarry that was due to be covered up. He is now in prison for the rest of his life, uh, being taken care of by taxpayers like you and I. FBI statistics have one in four uh, will be physically assaulted in their lifetime. Um, this is an, an unfortunate fact. It is not going to improve, at least in our lifetime. Uh, the police can help you. Uh, they're there to uh, protect our streets, but uh, oftentimes they have a hard enough time protecting themselves. Uh, what we're going to show you in this tape is some uh, rules of personal self-defense that you can follow and use in your everyday life. Um, it does not require a lot of training. What we're going to try to do is raise your level of awareness to prepare you for some of the situations you may face in your lifetime. Some people are not ready to commit <clears throat> to a uh, martial arts program or a self-defense course uh, because it takes a lot of practice and a lot of time. Uh, a lot of the women out there have families and uh, lead uh, full lives and they're not able to have the luxury of time to take uh, such a course. The situation may dictate, of course, depending on what happens, but we do know this for a fact. If you allow an attacker to take you from the initial victimization spot, you have only an approximately 3% chance of living. Uh, the principles we will cover today are a result of a great deal of study and consultation, plus a fair amount of actual experience. Please remember, self-defense skills require commitment and a desire to learn. Developing an assertive attitude requires no less. Realizing that you are important and deserve to be able to take care of yourself will motivate you to work daily on developing these attributes that allow you to walk through life unafraid of your environment. Okay, the next thing we'd like to talk about are the different mental conditions of readiness. 
We use a color code system to categorize the different conditions of readiness. White, if there's ever a condition that you don't want to be in, it's white. Uh, characterize of your head down, your shoulders down, walking through life, not noticing anything. Uh, drunk people, uh, not aware of their surroundings. Uh, people preoccupied on the street, uh, walking down, reading the newspaper. Totally not paying attention to anything that's going on around them. Uh, as I said, this is one of the worst conditions that you can be in uh, throughout your life. In yellow, this presents uh, a appearance of self-esteem, and with practice it becomes reflexive and second nature. Uh, living in yellow is the color of life and the springboard of survival. Uh, yellow is, we're not tr trying to make you uh, paranoid of your surroundings, we want you to be aware of your surroundings. We want you to be aware of some of the flags and some of the warning signals out there that a condition of white uh, you, you would not notice. We're talking about maybe a, uh, a car that's parked in front of your house with someone in it that had been sitting there for a long period of time. Uh, people, uh, groups of men in the parking lot just, just standing around with no women. Uh, different things like this that you should be able to pick up on uh, only if you are in the uh, mental state of yellow. Uh, in a condition of white, uh, you would not even notice these things and you do not consider your immediate surroundings to be threatening at all. Orange, this is the color of heightened awareness. It should not frighten you in any way. In this color, you have been made aware that something may happen. For example, walking through a parking lot with somebody loitering near your car or somebody closing in on your space. So what you have, it's similar to yellow, with the exception you have more adrenaline coming and you're aware immediately of the impending danger. In the condition of red, at this time you are now threatened, and you are now in a situation where things are happening to you that you do not want. In this condition, there will be a surge of adrenaline that must be controlled towards your advantage. At this time, it is time to take action and react. There is no time to think. You must react immediately using some of the principles of personal self-defense that we will now cover. The first principle of personal self-defense we'll cover is alertness. Now alertness is part of your uh, prevention. Now this is an inherent personality trait that we have had instinctively for thousands of years and modern day civilization has suppressed that instinct to be aware of your surroundings. Uh, it is inherent in everyone. Uh, in certain people it has been suppressed so far that they're living in that condition of white that we spoke about. It can be proved upon uh, by first of all accepting the fact that our environment uh, we are vulnerable to, to acts of violence. There's two basic rules um, that, that you should follow at all times in your life. Number one being be aware of who or what is behind you and be, be aware or take notice of things that are out of place in your environment. Certain things are obvious. You have things like an unfamiliar car that we spoke about previously outside of your home just sitting there and, and you've never seen it before, maybe one or two men in the car. Uh, or a car that maintains a, a distance, a, a consistent distance to you on the highway or even on, on a residential street. Makes turns where you turn, slow down when you slow down, speed up when you speed up. Take notice on young men in groups in parking lots. They have no women. They're just standing around, not really talking. Uh, these are the things that should set off your first stage alarms. Uh, and, and you should not be embarrassed to hold people accountable for their actions. It is your obligation to protect yourself and to protect your family. Decisiveness. Once you hey, last chance to take advantage of my YouTube flash giveaway. Get this foot long fixed blade Titan with an awesome sheath for free. There are now less than 200 available, but if you hurry and you're willing to pay a small shipping fee, I'll rush you out this $70 badass blade right away. Hi, my name is Gabo Garcia. I grew up in the mean streets of East LA. I've seen a lot of violence in our neighborhoods. What you're about to see is not pretty. There's simple things that does work. I'm gonna show you this a little later. First, I'm gonna show you some basic stuff that does work on the street.
first we have to learn to stand correctly. Our stands are legs apart, shoulder wide, bend your knees slightly so you can get a nice comfortable stance and you can move around as quick as you can. Front hand is called the front leading hand, elbow in, hand fist, back hand comes in this direction. I'm going to show you what a back knuckle is by using your whole hips into it, driving it into it. As you step into it, reverse punch goes into it. It gives you power from the back leg to drive your back hand into it. For example, I'm going to show you some techniques. Blocks, kicks, any of the other way you can invent your opponent. Put your right leg back. As your opponent comes towards you, you immediately you want to step to the side in a 45 degree blocking with your right hand, just nice open hand block, moving away from his punch, moving it up so you can get a nice drive into the hips, right into the rib section. That's an upper block. An inner block, punch with your little hand, is when the opponent comes, step out the side. Remember, you have to step out of this way, especially when it's nice and tall. Move your hand out. It gives you the same position as the other side as the ribs goes in, driving your whole hip into it. A head block is when it's coming towards you, squat down, stay in your stance, raise your hand, driving with the back leg, driving your body into it, right to his ribs. Remember, I weighed about 200 pounds. My opponent is maybe 350. Use your weight to drive your punch into his rib cage. All right, we're going to move on with elbows. Your elbow techniques are probably the most economical, and they actually cause the most deep tissue damage when you're involved in a, in a very close quarters combat confrontation like this. And they're very easy to land because of the distance between you and your enemy. Okay, but there, as, as everything before, they're initiated from that from that natural shooting platform that that you can move from. It's more of an athletic stance and your footwork's actually like a lot like basketball. It's probably the most realistic footwork when it's involved when when you're involved in close quarters combat with somebody else. Because you're constantly moving. From my shooting platform, again I gotta get close. I don't want to throw an elbow when I'm far away from my enemy. I don't want to step in and try to throw a long elbow. All he's got to do is move his head just a little bit out of the way and I'm gonna miss. That's going to put me back thinking defensively, and now he's going to go offensive, and he's going to get on me. So the idea is that when, when we do throw elbows, I need to close this distance and get close to him. But more than that, when I close, I've got to, I've got to do something to get a hold of him. Whether I'm holding on to a piece of clothing, his head, his hair, it doesn't matter, or even a piece of tissue on his face, or anywhere on his body, it doesn't matter. I just don't want him to go away when I start throwing elbows. I want him to stay put so that I can repeatedly drop my body weight behind the elbows that are probably the, the, the primary gross motor attack that we're gonna throw in close quarters. Okay, first elbow we're gonna cover is the horizontal elbow. Horizontal elbow is just gonna travel in a horizontal plane. I'm not gonna clench my fist when I throw this. My hand's just gonna be relaxed. From my elbow down to my hand, this doesn't influence the elbow, the trajectory of the elbow, or even the, the power or the impact of the elbow. I'm trying, the closer, the closer the impact area is to the mass of the fulcrum of my body, the heavier and harder it's going to be. So what I'm trying to do from my elbow down is I'm just trying to relax that portion of my body. I'm going to pretend that I have a coin or a rock or something in between my elbow, and I'm just going to close my elbow or my arm and keep that rock or that coin in there just to keep it tight to my body. I don't want to overextend this. I want to keep it nice and tight. And when we're throwing the elbows, it, it, we're, not, we're not really picking on exactly where you're, where you're impacting. It's really not that important. As long as I'm hitting on the bone area closest to the point of my elbow. I don't necessarily even want to hit with my elbow joint. When you're hitting somebody, especially on the hard skull with the tip of your elbow, and there are times with us overseas when we contact people, maybe a foreign military group that does, that's wearing helmets. We don't want to nail them with the tip of our elbow with the joint. We want to just try to hit with the bony surface closest to and just superior to our joint. So from our shooting platform, again, I got to get close. And that's when we're going to initiate with our initial attacks. I'm just going to shoot something out or some hand out just to, <clears throat> just to get it in there so I can get a hold of him. Now, once I get a hold of him, I'm going to just, I'm not going to pull back. I'm not going to uh, telegraph this just from where it just happens to be. I'm going to throw this elbow straight in. I'm going to loop it straight in, 
keeping it relaxed and throwing my whole body weight behind it when we talked when we discussed the tactical principle of mass throwing as much mass behind it and I'm bringing that elbow in horizontally anywhere on his face his head the side of his head his neck even at, even at times excuse me, even at times his chest I just want to get that heavy impact in there to start my attack process and start doing tissue damage again from my shooting platform I'm going to initiate my attack <clears throat> I'm just going to get something in there I'm going to get a hold of his body I'm going to throw the elbows in <clears throat> and I'm just going to jam these things in there as hard as I can repeatedly the mind's going to repeat itself if it's working if I'm just hitting him and it's working I'm just going to let it go let it happen if I switch sides on him whether I'm holding onto his hair or doesn't or any kind of handle I'm just going to keep this elbow just nice and natural and I'm driving it horizontally moving my entire body weight into the direction I'm throwing the elbow and trying to get as much mass behind it into his body to kind of do as much tissue damage as I can and to really disrupt his thought process and his decisionary process so that he can't fight back so really slow from a shooting platform any, any kind of initial attack even there are times even that I might just be able to reach out and grab him and I'm gonna throw that horizontal elbow with my entire body weight keeping my body tight I'm just gonna jam it in there as hard as I can just boom and just get it in nice and tight from the other side if we switch sides it's the same thing I'm just gonna turn my whole body weight and I'm cradling him just so I can get that elbow in there and if it's working I just keep it going and just keep nailing him with that elbow now the purpose of cradling him and holding on to him is I don't want to hit him and he goes away we got to start over we got to start this whole attack process over he knows the attacks happening now he's gonna go on the offensive and fight back and we don't want that we just want to go regardless of where I'm facing I may be looking at one enemy here I turn I switch I look at him we initiate and I'm just coming in I'm hitting him as hard as I can with as much body mass as I can that's the horizontal elbow Thanks for watching our video lessons here at TRS Direct. Hit the like button down below and consider subscribing to our channel here on YouTube. Hit the bell icon and we'll send you a notification when there's a new lesson available. Thanks again for watching.